Good evening, Bethlehem Baptist Church. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight, uh, our Wednesday evening uh, Bible study and prayer time via uh, live stream online this evening. And uh, this week, everyone's off due to uh, spring break, a lot of people traveling. Uh, we postpone all of our children's ministries for this week only, as well as our Bible study and prayer time. But uh, since we did not finish our lesson last week, I want to complete it tonight. That way we can start fresh next Wednesday night. So that's my plan and goal this evening as we finish up Habakkuk chapter 2. So if you've got your Bibles tonight, Habakkuk chapter 2. And uh, while you're finding your place, I want to thank our church. We had an incredible Easter Sunday service. Good singing. Everything was great. Good sunrise service. We just had a great time this past Sunday as well as the Sunday before that with the Easter drama, the Easter egg hunt. A lot of people worked really hard getting all this prepared and get it together. And I thank you so much for the bottom of my heart. And we had a great time. But anyway, let's look here in Habakkuk chapter 2. And uh, we looked at this subject last week. We've been looking at verses 6 through 20. There's five woes there in that passage of Scripture. And we're in this series, A Conversation with God. And... The subject matter is understanding the problem of sin, part two. And I began this week as I began last week with this question. What is wrong with the world? Why is it that this world seems so crazy? Why is it there's continual conflict in our families, in our churches, in our communities, in our world? What's wrong with this world? Well, once in the early 20th century, the London Times asked several famous authors to submit essays on this very topic what is wrong with the world? But the response of the writer G.K. Chesterton was directly to the point. He says, Dear sirs, I am yours truly, G.K. Chesterton. I am what's wrong with this world. The way this world was intended by its creator in the way that I am living are at odds. So what is wrong with the world? Three simple letters, S-I-N. We're all sinners, sin. We're, we're, all, we're not all the way we're supposed to be. And I thought about that subject, and we looked at this last week to kind of review what we talked about last week. People don't talk a great deal about sin anymore in a society that doesn't want to defend anybody. And it seems that we try to gloss over the problem of sin because we think we're doing okay. We gloss over it because probably sometimes it's someone else's fault. We gloss over it because we think very highly of ourselves. We, we gloss over it because we, fa we don't want to face the reality that we are all sinners. And it makes us angry because the truth of the word of God can be confronting at times. But we simply cannot gloss over the fact that we're sinners, hard as we may try to deny it. And it shows itself in bad habits and addictions and selfishness and greed and all manner of other uh, attitudes and moral failures. Sin is not just an act, it's also an attitude. And the offense is not only what we do, but in the attitude of our hearts. So let me define sin in way of introduction. What is sin? The word sin means to miss the mark and not share in the prize. Uh, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. I illustrated it's the soccer ball hitting the goalpost instead of the net. It's the spike on the runner's shoe that drifts outside the racing line and leads to disqualification. It's the running back's foot stepping out of bounds by a fraction of an inch. It's the last buzzer sounding before the release of a basketball for a three-point basket. We miss the mark of who or what we were meant to be and the consequences are significant. It, it means a deliberate violation, a transgression, a breaking of the rules. Uh, Romans 5.12 says, Wherefore is by one man sinner, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. So death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Sin is knowing what is right and choosing to do otherwise, saying no in the face of God. So the world of reality that God has made and the world of fantasy that we've created are diametrically opposed. And we're reaping the consequences of that fatal decision to choose our own world over God's. It seems today we try to grow spiritually and we try to evangelize, but we ignore our major problem, sin. We try to disciple without first coming to the end of ourselves and trusting Christ as Savior. See, discipleship's only effective if there's a new birth. You can't disciple somebody who's dead in their sins without Christ and the Holy Spirit helping them. 
You must be born again, the Bible says. On, on the other hand, how many times who we have believed in Christ and we've accepted him as our savior and we're free to live in obedience to him. How many times have we gone back, backwards in the sin of this old world? How many times do we who call on the heavenly resources and riches at our disposal, why do we like to go back and play in the garbage and then hide in it? What's wrong with this world? I am. Why? Because we're all sinners in need of a savior. We all have a sin problem that can be only remedied by the cross of Jesus Christ. So that thought, that introduction, as we mentioned last week, sets the stage and dominates the rest of Habakkuk chapter 2. As we have seen so far in our series on Wednesday nights, Habakkuk's burden leads to a conversation with God asking him, God, are you indifferent to the sin of this world? Habakkuk looked around the society around him at that time. God, are you indifferent to the sin of this world? God responds back to Habakkuk and says, I am working in ways you cannot imagine. In this case, in chapter one, he says, and when he answers Habakkuk, it's a conversation with God. He's raising up the Chaldeans, the Babylonians to conquer Judah in a world where Assyria and Egypt were vying for world dominance. Habakkuk doesn't like the answer, so he asks God, appealing to his character. So the first question, God, are you indifferent to the sin of the world? God answers, I'm working in ways you cannot imagine, leads to another question. God, are you inconsistent with the sinners of the world? Why would you use a sinful nation to conquer your people? And he's so burdened by this, he climbs up to the top of a watchtower with the attitude, when God speaks to me to reprove me, I will listen. I will make adjustments. Chapter two records God's answer. What does God do to answer Habakkuk's question? He gives Habakkuk a song, a lament exposing the evils of Babylon. And in this song, there are five woes. Each woe gives a description to understanding the problem of sin. Habakkuk, there's a song, write a poem, a negative song, a song of lamenting. And, you know, the purpose of a song, a lament, was to take truth and put it in song so people will remember it. And there's five stanzas here, each beginning with the word woe. So we have five points. We looked at the first three last week. We're looking at the last two tonight. The word, the word woe, frustration upon the Babylonians who, in the moment, they look so strong and so fierce. They can have everything they want, but five stanzas shows us how pride, how sin can ultimately help, help ultimately fail. Verse six, all the nations that are now being destroyed by Babylon shall not take up a parable against Babylon and a mocking song. And when the Bible uses the word woe, it's never a good thing. The word woe, an interjection, it's usually of lamentation. The word woe occurs 50 times in the prophets and once elsewhere. Six times it refers to the mourning of the dead. Forty involve negative warnings or threats of God's physical chastisement. Sin may bring excitement in the moment. In the end, there's sadness, there's lamentations or woe. These woes are not just pronounced upon Babylon, but also against the Israelites who practice these same sins in this book. The very reason why Babylon is getting ready to conquer and the reason it prompted Habakkuk to ask the first question in chapter one to God. Through this conversation, through these woes, God's response to Habakkuk and his question, we understand through this, we understand the problem of sin. So let's review. We looked last week at the first woe from verse six through eight in chapter two. And the problem of sin begins with selfishness. Selfishness increases what is not yours. Woe to him that increases what is not his. How long? Woe to the person who takes everything that doesn't belong to him. Selfishness burdens you down with a heavy debt. And Babylon had taken the gold and the silver, the worthless clay, the yellow, the white dust, thinking they're increasing their fortune, but in reality, weighing themselves down. And we looked at selfishness causes you to reap what you sow. Babylon plundered other nations. She herself would be plundered. She had shed rivers of blood. Her blood would be shed. A basic law of the universe is that we reap what we sow. So the problem of sin we looked at last week began with selfishness. Secondly, the problem of sin leads to covetousness. Uh, chapter 2, verse 9 through 11. And we looked at the fact that covetousness creates a false sense of security. 
He says, woe to him that covets evil gain for his house. And the, the Babylonians were covetous. They wanted power. They wanted wealth. They wanted luxury. They wanted honor. And all that went along with it. The driving motivator was pride. Their goal was security. They took what was not theirs to build a high nest of safety. And it was a false security. Because any security outside the security of the Lord himself is a false temporal security. And it will not last. No individual, no nation can build walls high enough to keep God out. In our lives, we covet when we say, I can only have, if, we, if I only have this, if I have this money, if I have this thing or I have that, my troubles will be over. We say that we, I can have security, but what we're doing, we're coveting because we're comparing ourselves to others who have things that we want because we think that's what makes them likable or, or secure, etc. But the truth is, oh, my friend, only Jesus Christ can give you confidence and security and fulfillment. Covetousness leads to a real sense of shame. The consequences of this covetousness, that instead of having houses and families that bring honor, they will have disgrace and shame and will eventually lose their lives. So the problem of sin begins with selfishness and it leads to covetousness, as is the illustration here in chapter 2 with the Babylonian army. But we look at uh, chapter 2, verses 12 through 14, and the problem of sin acts on oppressiveness. We, we finished up with that point last week from verse 12 through 14 because sin will cause you to become oppressive. And he goes, Woe to him that builds a town with bloodshed. The city and empire of Babylon was built by bloodshed, the blood of innocent victims. It was built by prisoners of war, slave labor that was exploited. Babylon was building its kingdom on the backs of people it was dominating, using slave labor, the people they dominated. They didn't care about the lives of people. People would die. A city that was established by blood. And um, we, we looked at the idea of modern day. You're taking advantage of people. You're manipulating people. God was not going to bless that. Uh, don't take advantage of people. Treat them properly. Don't build your project, business, church, etc. on the backs of people with manipulative means. Do right by people. Sin will act on oppression and lead to oppression in your life, and sin will cause others to be oppressed. Um, he goes into that rhetorical question as he, as he finishes up as we looked at last week because you know God causes all plans and peoples who are opposed to him to fail. And the only labor that is a means of something is the labor of the gospel, gospel-centered ministry based upon the finished work of Christ and events in his kingdom and his glory. So we looked at those first three woes last week. We're going to finish tonight. That was review. We're going to look at verse 15 through the rest of the chapter tonight. Verse 15 to, through verse number, oh, let me see here, verse, verse 20. And we're going to look at the last two. So we've seen that the problem of sin begins with selfishness. It leads to covetousness. It acts on oppressiveness. But number four, the problem of sin causes shamefulness. Look at verse 15. It says, Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor, pressing him to your bottle, even to make him drunk, that you may look on his nakedness. You are filled with shame instead of glory. You also drink and be exposed as uncircumcised. The cup of the Lord's right hand will be turned against you and utter shame will be on your glory. For the violence of Lebanon, for the violence done to Lebanon will cover you and the plunder of beasts, which made them afraid because of men's blood and the violence of the land and the city and all who dwell in it. They shame their neighbors. Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor. The repulsive picture here is both personally and nationally. This is more than just a verse on just alcohol and giving somebody else alcohol. It's an illustration of how Babylon was destroying its enemy deceptively. Hey, I'm here to help you. Have a drink. Babylon was deceiving people into buying into their system and exploiting them. Here, I'm your friend. Have a drink. That person is drunk and take advantage of in a licentious way. There's a, a suspension of judgment that leads to shame. And that's how temptation always works. The word neighbor, friend, companion. Another person could refer to a neighboring nation that was, quote unquote, intoxicated by Babylonians power and, and made naked before their invading armies. They treated their neighbors, their victims with inhumane and indignities like someone who makes his neighbor drunk. They can take pleasure in that person's shameful nakedness. A graphic picture, picture there. And the Bible warns repeatedly against the evils of strong drink and alcohol in Proverbs 20, verse one and several verses in Proverbs. In this instance, drunkenness and sensual behavior go together. 
See, temptation at first always looks attractive and controllable. Hey, just one drink. Eventually what temptation does is becomes attractive and uncontrollable. You may have felt good or high, but you're just not in control of yourself. It eventually turns into behavior you're going to regret. The ultimate end of temptation, unattractive, control, uncontrollable place, maybe addiction or regret, etc. Babylon was slick and sly. They were deceptive. Not just dominated militarily, but also deceptive. And in scripture, drinking a cup of wine can be a picture of judgment. Jeremiah 25, 15. And nakedness sometimes speaks of the devastating effects of military invasion in Isaiah 47. The bottle, your poison, poisonous wrath, poisonous wine. So they would be shamed. They shame their neighbors. And that's what sin does in our lives, but God would shame them. You are filled with shame instead of glory. What Babylon did to others, God would do to her. Your glory is really your shame. God says, I see the substance of it, and your whole life is a sham. Babylon had been a golden cup in God's hands, Jeremiah 51, verse 7. But God had used that golden cup of Babylon to chase the nations, but God will now give her a cup of drink that will bring her to ruin. Divine retribution. The violence done to other nations will be done to her. The glory of the Lord will cover the earth, but Babylon, Babylon's glory will be covered in shame. And there's a picture there of shameful spewing. The picture is a repulsive drunk vomiting all over himself. And that's not a very pretty picture. It's embarrassing. Let me be in the one in control. Let me give you a taste of your own medicine and your nakedness will be uncovered. Everyone's going to know you're not mine. Uncircumcised, no covenant relationship. Uncover who you really are. The cup of my wrath, the cup of my judgment. You see, there's two glories in life, friend. The glory of God and the glory of man. One is temporal, the other is eternal. One will last, the other shame. Sin causes a shame, a painful feeling of humiliation or distress caused by the consciousness of wrong or foolish behavior. There's coming a day when sin will rise to the surface and you can try to hide it, but it's always going to rise to the surface. Be sure your sin will find you out. It would, it would be for Babylon. And in our lives, the same thing happens with shame, shamefulness. And they will be covered by the same shame. It says, for the violence done, for the violence done in Lebanon will cover you, verse 17. For, because, let me tell you why, because you without regard took advantage of people, stripped the forest of Lebanon, plundered the habitat for animals. You're not going to be known for your accomplishments. You're going to be known for your evil. The violence done to Lebanon by several rulers, cutting in its great forest and killing its cattle. Note the way God mentions the way Babylon abused the trees and animals, suggesting that the soldiers wastefully chopped down trees and killed cattle to use the wood and the meat for the war effort, for the purpose of conquest, taking what is not theirs and lifting up themselves. What they dished out in conquest would be done to them. They would be covered by the same violence and spoil. How we take advantage of people will turn on us. So the problem of sin causes shamefulness. Number five. The last woe there, verse 18 and 19, the problem of sin is rooted in idolatry. Look at verse 18. What profit is the image that its maker should carve it, the molded image, a teacher of lies, that the maker of its mold should trust in it to make mute idols? Woe to him who says to the wood, awake, to the silent stone arise, it shall teach. Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, yet in it there is no breath at all. There's the question of idolatry here. Verse 18, what is idolatry? He says, what profit is the image that his maker should carve it? Romans 125, worshiping and serving the creature instead of the creator, that's idolatry. How would God in his rebuke exposure on Babylon as well as tell us about understanding sin comes back to worship. At the core of who we are and what we do is a matter of worship. It's a matter of whom the God to whom we submit and what God says to Babylon. You've erected these idols to, your, to yourself. Think about Nebuchadnezzar's big old image in Daniel chapter uh, three. See, idols are dead substitutes for the living God. Whatever people delight in other than God, whatever they are devoted to and sacrifice for, what they couldn't bear to do without, that's an idol and it's under the condemnation of God. Anything you have that you cannot give away you don't really own. It owns you. Babylon was guilty of this sin of idolatry. Judah was even guilty of this sin. In Habakkuk's day, you and I are even guilty of this sin. It's the root of the problem. This question points out two things I do with idols. 
I carve it, I mold it, I trust in it. And it also points out two things what's true about the idol. It's a teacher of lies, it's dumb, it cannot even speak. The question brings me the task, what profit is it? When I set up an idol in my heart, how does it really benefit me? It deceives me by giving me a false sense of security. But get, he gives an answer to this question in verse 19, and that's that fifth woe. Woe to him who says to the wood, awake, to the silent stone, arise, and it shall teach. We want that idol to wake up. And when all in the reality, it's an image, it's an idol. How ridiculous is it that we set up these idols that we know in the back of our mind that we've created them, we made them, and somehow we want them to speak to us or teach us? Notice that Habakkuk refers to it as an image. My mind and your mind is really good at molding and carving and engraving images, what we look at, what we hear, what we're exposed to. And sometimes we worry about the future and all the negative possibilities so much that we mold and carve and engrave images in our minds to the extent we're not only molding it and shaping it, but we're trusting in it. We want the idol to rise up when that idol has no life at all. When I begin to trust in that idol, Whatever it is in my mind or physical, I always go back to that idol for my quote unquote security blankets. What I'm saying to the idol is rise up. In fact, the idol had no life to begin with. We want the idol to be covered up. What we think is valuable, silver and gold in this instance. Not only that I overlay it with silver and gold, I put more value on my mind like I should. I'm haunted by these thoughts that are images and idols and I've got to destroy it. i got to destroy these things. i got to dethrone them in my life if I'm ever to be right with God. We think about these things and we shouldn't because we're molding and we're crafting in our minds and we're teaching us nothing but lies to the extent we're trusted in these things more than we are in God. The tension that mankind has between conscious and carnality is idolatry. Right and wrong, conscious, in my flesh, what I want. Manage it with idolatry. And, and we give a tip of the hat to God. We, we, try to balance, we try to balance it. and We try to justify our ability to feed our flesh. But at the end of the day, my friend, it's self-worship, idolatry. I've come up with this religious code of conduct and it suits what I want to do. Covetousness is idolatry. The things we set up in our lives and take our attention we want that to speak to us. It signifies the self-worship, the self-gratification that characterizes our nation and even in our churches, unfortunately. So we've, we've looked at these things about understanding sin and, and, and God's exposure of Babylon and, you know, this whole Babylonian world system influences us. Selfishness, shamefulness, idolatry. We see oppressiveness, covetousness. We see those things understanding that problem of sin. So, but you know, here's a good application. In light of the problem of sin in this world, Habakkuk is given three wonderful assurances as we wrap up chapter two. When burdens arise, when answers are revealed, there are three wonderful assurances that God gives us in chapter two to encourage his people. We looked a few weeks ago how God assures us of his grace. Chapter two, verse one, four, the just shall live by faith. Grace and faith always go together. We mentioned a lot about that a few weeks ago, about the just shall live by faith. Another assurance in verse 14 is how God assures us of his glory. We looked at that last week. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Though this world today is filled with violence and corruption, one day it'll be filled with God's glory. But we finally see in verse 20, the last verse of this chapter, how God not only assures us of his grace and his glory, but he assures us of his government. Look at verse 20. But the, earth, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. That's an assuring verse, my friend, because empires will rise and fall. But God is on the throne and he is king of kings. He is Lord of lords. Therefore, we shouldn't complain against God or question what he's doing. Like faithful servants, we must simply stand and listen for his commands like Habakkuk. Basically, another parallel to this verse is be still and know that I am God. Cease striving and know that he is God. Psalm 46, verse 10. We see here the first part, God is sovereign. The Lord is in his holy temple. God is in control of everything. God is sovereign, all-knowing, and nothing takes him by surprise. The answer of it all, you see, the answer to all that Habakkuk asks is right there in verse 20. Regardless of how bad it seems out there, 
It, it, you know, weak, it seems in our country, how powerful the Babylonians appear to be. There are three truths. God is not dead. God is not changed. And God is not moved. Thus, I must move my thoughts, dethrone my idols. I must think and focus on the fact that he's still in charge and he has a plan. And with this in mind, I surrender my way and my control to his way and his control. But he's sovereign and I must be silent. Let all the earth keep silence before him. These lifeless idols in verse 18 and 19 are contrasted with the living God. And those calling to idols are awake and told to keep quiet for the Lord. Another way of saying it is, be still and know that I am God. In other words, after all these things have been said concerning the providence of God, the pride of man, the problem of sin, the trials about to begin, the judge is on his bench, therefore let the court remain silent. And when I'm silent, I begin to understand and hear God. We got to focus ourselves. We got to center ourselves. We got to see striving. We got to uh, get rid of those distractions and just gear ourselves so we can hear God speak in a still small voice. Be still and know he's in charge. He's still God. He's still got a plan. And none of this is taking God by surprise. The things we face today, just like them in Babylon are loud and fierce and clamoring for attention and they make us worry and, and we're intimidated, but God has not died. God has not changed. God has not moved. So be silent. Stop and find a quiet spot and be still and know he's in control. And maybe all this the craziness of the last two years in our culture today, maybe it's caused us just to stop and still know that he is God. Seeing the vision of God and hearing the voice of God made a tre tremendous difference in Habakkuk's life. As he grasped the significance of three great assurances God gives him, verse 4, verse 14, and verse 20, he was transformed from being a warrior in chapter 1 to a watcher in chapter two, and we're gonna begin next Wednesday night in chapter three, where he goes from worrying to watching to becoming a worshiper. And our next few lessons as we finish up this book, Habakkuk will share with us the vision he had of God and the difference it makes in his life. From chapters one to chapter three, you see a changed man. Maybe it should be the same with us. We're worried about a lot of things in life. We're asking God things, God responds through his word. He wants us to be still and know he's God. And somehow, some way, we get our focus right back on the Lord and how it's supposed to be. And we go from worrying to watching to worshiping. We'll begin chapter three next week on how Habakkuk worships God. What a wonderful song he composes as he ends his book of the Bible. Well, let me have a word of prayer with y'all tonight. You should have been emailed the prayer list for this week. There'll be copies there in the lobby on the table. I want to pray with you. Thank you so much for tuning in. And after I'm praying, we'll be done. Have a good rest of the week. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this time together in the study of your word. Lord, I pray you bless this series that we've been in every Wednesday night. And I pray you use it to speak to hearts and to comfort people and to, to help them. As you know, sometimes we've got so much we worry about. And God just wants us to be still and know he's God. Help us to focus intently on you. Get us there, Lord. Be with our church. Be with our people. Be with all those on our prayer list who are sick, uh, got prayer needs, things like that. Lord, I pray you answer according to your will. We thank you for Christ. Give us a good weekend. Give us a great Sunday, this coming Sunday. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. God bless you. Have a good evening.